<laughs> I said, I want to give honor to God, our Creator, and Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. That's allowed us to be here today. Now, I'm impressed of where we are because we are in a historic location. 17th Street has a rich history of racial equality and balance in our society. I want to first just say that I'm happy that the turnout is here today. That is encouraging that the citizens want to be a part. Now I'm candidate Herbert and Palmore, candidate and in common a war two. I was raised here in Anston, Alabama. I went to school in Calhoun County Training School with the Alabama State University, uh, Alabama State, that is the Hornets. And also transferred to Jacksonville State University. I'm a retired military, I'm a retired state trooper, and so I know about organization, I know about discipline. I know how to arrange and organize things around. I had to work by myself in several counties. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. And now, Mr. Goodson. How's everybody doing today? All right. All right. My name is Shepton Goodson. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge my family here, my mother, my daughter, and also my brother here. Most of all, I want to thank you all in the community for coming out today. Give yourselves a round of applause. All right. What we have here today, we have this right here represents progress. And that's what I represent. I represent progress and improvement in what Aniston City can produce. I was born and raised here in Aniston. I was educated in the Aniston City School System. I graduated from Aniston High School in 2005. Once I left there, I received education in business at the Culver House Business School, and I am interested in further in my career as far as in education. I am a personal business banker for Wells Fargo Bank. That is my career. I'm there all week. I also partner with my father and run a business. We serve over 100 families here in Aniston, Alabama, and I also serve 50-plus families in Roanoke, Alabama. So I do know what it takes to get things done. Again, like I said, I'm here to represent progress. I'm here to represent youth and what youth leadership and what passing the torch represents. It represents youth leadership and the city moving forward. Thank you for your vote. Vote Chef and get some more to Canada. Yeah. And now, Mr. Red. How's everybody doing tonight? Hello. I want to thank everybody for coming out here also. Thank you for showing interest and concern about what's happening in our community. I am David Reddick. I want to be a Ward 2 City Councilman. And like I said last night, if you're happy with your city, if you're happy with where we are right now, if you're happy with Aniston, don't vote for me. Don't vote for me if you're satisfied with the fact that 31% of our citizens make less than $15,000 a year. I'm not the candidate for you if you want to keep saying that. Don't vote for me if you're happy with the fact that 17% of our city makes less than $1,000 a month. Don't vote for me if that's all right with you. But if you want to see change, I have a background in the military. I served in one of the 10 most dangerous jobs while I served in the U.S. Navy. And I had a job that if you make one mistake, it can cause me and everybody around me my, their lives. So I know how important and I know the gravity of what I do. I understand cohesion. I have a background in sales and I have a background in hospitality and tourism. We're losing millions of dollars a year and our tourism budget right here in this city, right now, where we stand now. And I want to fix that. So if you want somebody that's going to bring hope, opportunity, and the change we need in Aniston, vote for me, David E. Reddy. Thank you. Thank you very much. This next question will start with Mr. Goodson and then go uh, to his left after that. Mr. Goodson, are you willing to support the city manager form of government that Aniston has currently? Yes, I support it. I also support other forms of government. Now, an effective city manager council government works when you have all the people in place and everybody is on one accord. All right? When everybody has a plan and everybody knows what the results are from that plan. Now, in the event that you don't have everybody on one accord, 
then other forms of government, as our neighbors operate on, they operate on the mayor government, where one person has the ability to make that decision. Now, when you have a city that involves community, and pretty much the city manager deal, it puts accountability back in the hands of that one person. That council is responsible for the actions and the results that that city manager displays. What we have to do here in that is that we have to hold our people responsible. The person who is in charge of the results of this city, if it's going to be that city manager, that needs to be a person who's capable of producing a projective plan, producing results. He needs to be results driven as far as managing a budget and a multi-million dollar budget and also displaying back to the community and getting people's buy-in on what is the best thing for this community. So to answer your question, I do support it. And as long as it works, and it works good for Aniston, I support it. Thank you. Thank right. you. Mr. Redding, same question. Are you willing to support the city manager form of government? Okay, let me explain what the city council, city manager form of government is. What that means is, if you, there's three, there's three main forms of government. You got a weak mayor, you got a strong mayor, then you got a council manager form of government. With a strong mayor, city council sit together and they write something, and the mayor has the power to veto it. He gets the final say in the bill. Then with this weak mayor, everybody has the same amount of vote, but you know, you don't have a city manager running everything, so you guys are basically all full time. With the city council, city manager form of government, the city council decides what they want to happen, and when they make a decision, it's that city manager's job to carry out everything that happens. Now, in a proper management situation, when you got the proper city manager, city council make the laws, and the city manager knows how to make this happen. And if, he, if he's not doing his job, you get rid of him and get, and get a better city manager. So right now, with our city council, city manager forum, I don't see the city being big enough to have a strong mayor, and I don't think the people are, are ready to have one person making all the decisions for us. Uh, with a weak mayor, I don't think we have enough um, councilmen with the proper education to run it. So I think right now, our choice is the city council, city manager form of government, but all our council should be educated and letting everybody know what the city manager needs to do and his job should make that city run smoothly, which makes the city manager inherently the strongest person in that city. So that's the sacrifice we have to make. The city manager is actually the strongest uh, entity in the city. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mr. Palmore, do you support the current city manager council form of government? Yes, I do, but with his beliefs. City manager operates the city. <coughs> he hires, he dismisses employees. He supervises day to day activity. The city council establishes procedures and policies. Now, you asked about other forms of government that I heard. Strong mayor is ideal. But you have to have cooperation. And it, even if it was city manager, you have to have cooperation among each individual. The city manager has to be correct in the how he uh, carry out the orders of the city council, but you also must have a city council that can carry out procedures and do it properly. I just want to let you know that everyone talking about Anderson City Council, disarray, confused, and had an argument and fight. But I want to make a statement to you. You can stand here and you go back history. You go back all the answers of the history. As long as since I've been here in 2000, I have not been an embarrassment to this city. I have not been involved in arguments, fights. I lack constructive debates. Now, I often confer with the city manager. We usually have an evening where I go by and talk to him of day-to-day -day activities of what I found out from complaints and what I hear from the citizens. A city manager form of government can be ideal. It can be a good source of communication and progress for the city. Now, what my point in here is, are you going to, are the council going to cooperate with the city manager? Is the city manager going to carry out the duties? Are uh, he going to be a city man that want to run everything? Or uh, he going to be a city man that weak, that won't talk to the council? And the council needs to be cooperative with the city manager and don't dominate him and don't think that you own him. 
Thank you, Mr. Powell Moore. The next question will start with Mr. Reddick. Go pass the microphone down. Thank you. What will be your plan to expedite, uh, I guess, the destruction or the taking down of the abandoned houses in War II? That, that's a sensitive issue because a lot of it has a lot to do with funding and all of that. First of all, this is what I would do. I would hire two full-time grant writers to assist the one part-time grant writer that we got working currently for the city of Anniston. And I'll get those two full-time grant writers and that one part-time grant writer we already have to, to see how much funding we can get that isn't even coming out of the city's budget. And what I would do with that is see how many of those we can rebuild and restore. Once we rebuild and restore these, and we're going to pay a fair wage to the, building, to the owner of that house. We're going to pay them for their home too. And once we rebuild and restore, I'm going to move people out of these projects, out of these Section 8 apartments. I'm going to move them into these, put them on a program, a financial literacy program that's goal-oriented and teach them how to rebuild and restore their credit. And when they're done going through this program, and after they made proficiency in learning the education and proficiency in paying their rent, I'm going to deed that house over to that person and make homeowners out of these people in this city that's struggling right now to make their bills. And I'm gonna teach these people how to send their kids to college. I'm gonna teach them how to set five, 10, and 20 year goals and achieve them. And we're gonna change the entire dynamics and have a paradigm shift happen right here in this city. That's what I plan to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palmore, you're next. What should the city do about the abandoned houses in War II? First thing, let's talk about absentee homes. That's where we have the delayed, dilapidated homes. Because the absentee owners walk away, often people inherit the houses, and they have no love or interest in them. So to save money, they don't put anything back in. Now, to get funding for that, we allocate money out of the budget to accommodate destruction of the houses. But I have often tried to find other family members to come and take over the houses. We have a rebuild program with the CDBG that if you take the house, we will loan you the money and we will give you some free money to rebuild the house. So we are trying to make sure that we have property owners in this state, in this city. If you have property owners here, they pay taxes. If you collect taxes, that means you have more money to function with. Now to micromanage people. You can't give a person a house and try to micromanage it. You have a program that they should learn to take care of themselves. The city should be instructed. I'm not going to be a one part of one going in and tell you how to clean your living room. We give you a house. You should be responsible enough to operate that. But we have complaints about people. Some say, well, why don't you do something about the elaborate house? Others say, tear down too many. Yeah. There's no clear answer. But one thing for sure, it takes money to tear them down, and we very seldom get the money back. But if we put people in those homes, then they will become taxpayers and productive citizens of this city. And thank you, Mr. Palmore. Now, Mr. Goodson, the same question. What do you do with the abandoned houses in War II? Uh, that's an important issue, and this is very dear to me, uh, due to the fact that I do love real estate investment. What we have to do is we have to get everybody on the same playing field. We have to get the community on the playing field. We have to get Habitat for Humanity and other outside organizations who invest in the development and revitalization of the community. But first thing is first, we can't just go in taking over people's properties. We have to do things properly and get our laws in order that allow us to revitalize our community. Once we have ironed out everything as far as law-wise, then we can go in. We can destroy these properties, but putting them back into the hands of people who want to build home. We have to increase the home ownership within that community. The reason that those homes are, just like Mr. Palmore said, the reason that those homes are there is because people move from the community. 
We have to put people back in that community, and the way you do that, you bridge the generational gap on the people who moved out from the youth who are coming up in it. So what you do is you go and tear those lots down. You tear them down, but also you remarket those. You have a dedicated market team, a revitalization team, a development team that go back in, remarket those properties, and put people in those homes to get those tax dollars coming back to that community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Palmore, this question goes to you now. And there are actually two people who ask pretty much the same question. Why do we have only one Center for Senior Citizens in Aniston? There are four wards and only Ward 1 has a Senior Citizen Center. Let me, let me tell you how that goes. The Citizens Council gives money to park and recreation. We have an excellent center, but the economy has required that we move it all to one location. Now, we have several senior citizen homes. One is, let's say the one in Blue Mountain, Hill Chris, Chris Hill. I, several years ago, provided a provision for the people together and keep themselves together and socialize and keep that community cohesive. You have to remember, our senior citizens are our responsibility, but we have more than just a one center. We had Randolph Park, we had Carver Center, we had South Howard, but the people, the senior citizens, you need to talk to them before you start at these course. They wanted to come together and that's the reason they are so happy to have a, a location where they can be happy. We will provide that at Fort McKinnell, renovated, and you need to go and visit it. We need to know that, that these people that we are responsible for, they are our seniors. They raise us. And we need to understand that they have their own pride themselves. They don't want to be shifted to the side. So when they ask for to have a special place for their, their all their friends to go, come together and meet, I accommodated that. And one thing about it, we all, in all wars, all council members, agree and cooperate to have this happen. That way you have to have cooperation. You have to have understanding. And you have to have a deep love for the citizens. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. Mr. Goodson, the same question, why only one senior citizen center, four wards, and only ward one has a senior citizen center in it? Okay, I can't attest to why we only have one. I'm not in that seat yet. Uh, but what I can attest to is that if we see that the one that we have has definitely been a benefit for our senior citizens and given them a sense of responsibility and also a part in this community, then what we have to do is we have to plan and we have to strategize to get them another one. We have to bring everybody, we bring the community together from all four wards. From all four wards. We hear community aspects from all four wards, and we strategically plan and ask our senior citizens, where do you want your second location to be? And invest in that. We are here to invest in our senior citizens, and I am open to definitely getting our senior citizens and additional home. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ray, same question. What about the senior citizen centers? Why don't we have seen more than one senior citizen center? And what can we say? Leadership, advocacy. We need more people to understand that. I stand here, not as an individual, but on the shoulders of all those who have come before me. And when I understand the importance of that, it makes me work harder to bring in what we need to, to create more of that. We have to we do we have to research it. We have to see how we can become economically viable enough for the city to sustain such an entity. If you guys, look, everybody look at that paper that's on the front door and read those questions and ask them if you haven't read them yet. And, and see what everybody's vision is to create some economic viability. And I'm all for uh, carrying on the legacy that has been left for me by those who have come before me, those who have struggled, suffered, died, and I understand the importance of that. 
So we have to basically sit back, take a look, and bring in the people that's going to advocate for the people who, in their later years, should be more comfortable because they've stood and they they they've been beaten, they've been torn, they've been abused. So we need to make sure that the end, the last part, is better than the first part. So. Um, why is there no senior citizens' homes? That's a good question for more of our citizens to begin to ask and begin to ask of their leaders. And I want you guys to start asking that question a whole lot more because guess what? The baby boomer generation is now becoming our senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you. This next question will go to Mr. Goodson first. You've been talking a lot, all three of you, about the word leadership. Well, the question is, how do you plan to build leadership in the city if you're elected to the city council? That's a great question. It's called conversation. Let me tell you how important conversation is. We can break it down into three ways. Your legacy. Your, le your legacy starts the conversation. Where you are today, it attests to your brilliance. But where you're going, it attests to your ambition. We have to have ambition, we have to have vision, and we have to have dreams, not small dreams. We have to dream big. I didn't wake up yesterday and say I'm 25 and want to run for city council. All right? It was put in me. It was instilled in me. Leadership is instilled in you. And you have to have strong, firm leaders and intelligent. You can't confuse arrogance for confidence. You can't confuse knowledge for arrogance. You have to address strong leaders, and you have to put them in place and let them lead. You have to let them lead. And once they lead, it's going to take a community to get behind them and push them. I'm at the front of the line, but I need a hundred more people behind me to make sure that when I get tired, that I continue to lead and work for you as a community. So that's what I would bring. I would bring Thank you very leader. much. Thank, Thank you. you. How do you build leadership if you're on the city council? If elected, how am I going to build leadership in Aniston? Right here. Look at this young man right here. He's a good candidate also. If I'm elected, I'm going to put him on the boards he needs to be on. I'm going to put him around the people he needs to be on. So he can grow with this city. I'm going to put him on the people like this so that he can see, you know, what it takes. Because... We need, like you said, we need a hundred more people. We need a hundred more people that knows how to follow. And, 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 and I didn't know it all. I have so many mentors, <laughs> male and female, so many men and women that placed into my life, that put into my life. And I was like their shadow. I mean, I stayed under somebody that had something to teach me. I spent so much time up under them, they had to shoot me away. They can't get rid of me. That's anybody out here that I've ever found that I can learn something from. That's how hard it is to get rid of me. See, and I want to instill that into our young leaders so they can become wiser, stronger, more proficient older leaders. And they need to learn that from the older leaders because the Bible says he calls the young because they're what? Strong. And they calls the old because they're what? Wise. So why don't we get some strong people with some wise people and we can carry this whole city. We're going to put some boards together with some young people and some older people and they're going to create visions and goals and opportunities right here in this city. And that's what I plan to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cockmore, if you are re-elected, how do you build leadership on the city council? I'll leave just like I've been doing. I'll show you. And let me explain to you before you want to get. Let's quiet down. I have come up with a lot of ideas how to, how to develop this city. First thing is that to move that middle school was my first proposal. That was my proposal that for us to do that, we have to have land for economic development. We moved the middle school to the high school, and through bond money, we were going to build the middle school. The school system would be responsible for a bill. They have a building that they can maintain. Now, I've created a lot of other ideals through my leadership. I am, I am a leader. If or not, you would have observed uh, how I act. I conduct myself with attitude that but the attitude of a smaller mind. 
I carry myself with respect and dignity. You have to have that air about you for people to want to believe in you. Now, I, on our police department, I saw the need. We put the street task force back into operation. That was my suggestion. We needed that. Now, a lot of times you have to take leadership and be criticized. The vocation school, I came up with the idea, and I don't like to say I did all this, but I came with the idea, and the city council members <coughs> voted to fund the vocation school because I saw the need of our young people needing the education and skills. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. That's uh, the end of two minutes. This next question uh, begins uh, over there. Let me see. I made sure I get it right. We start with Mr. Reddick on this one. What will you do to bring back businesses to West Anniston? Um, there's, there's many things we need to do. One, rezoning. We need to make sure that our city is zoned. A lot of businesses should be inside our communities, but they're not zoned to a lot of habit. But we got to do it legally. We got to do take the right procedures. Second, we, you know, the Anderson City has a travel budget, and that travel budget is for me to go out and recruit business, recruit people, recruit laws, and to learn how to make my city a better city. You know, my opponent has gone over his travel budget repeatedly. But do you see more business? Do you see bigger business? Do you see your businesses moving better? I will go out and use the travel budget for what it's for. I have a background in sales. I know how to talk to people. I know about hot button sales. I know about hot button topics. I know how to get together and get our community looking good. I know how to, I sell the cars. I, 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 know, I know the importance of taking that car out and wash it real quick before the customer comes, spray some smell good in it right before they come and look at it. And I want to do that with the city, clean it up, make it look good. And then when I get through, I can go out here and recruit these businesses, push their hot buttons, make them real, feel real good inside about bringing their business right here to Anderson. And I want to help the small business, showing the importance of what our, um, um, uh, Showing some of the support systems we have right here in the city that can help them gain more money, more income, uh, guarantee more loans, and the such, so that they can come in and rebuild their small businesses to be more proficient and more. Um, I can teach them on. Um, sorry, uh, I can teach them on um, hospitality and tourism. I can teach them on the importance of networking, and I can teach a whole host of things through the Chamber of Commerce so that they'll be able to go out and build, not just start a business, but start an uh, effective business and start a successful business. And that's what I plan to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reddick. Now back to Mr. Palbor. What will you do to bring more business back <coughs> to West Anniston? I started that my very first year. We, we remodeled and set a renovation fund to set aside for all the small business owners to renovate as business. We did all the infrastructure. We paid for it. No cost. They had all that to put roofs, doors, windows to make them more attractive because I remember as a young man walking down 15th Street, that was a weekend exercise to come down on 15th Street. And I, and I was very disappointed when I came back from the military, that it was gone. So now, that's the reason you see stores being revitalized on 15th Street. Now we have a program of a revolving loan. That in addition to the free grant money that we gave, that we give low income, a low payment back for owners to borrow money to help me do their business and function. We as, we as a council, we must take effect of what we are doing. We, we affect a lot of people when we do, may take action. I think that as my effort, 15th Street is on the growth. It was dead when I got in office. Was it in the business? The business, couldn't, the business owner couldn't afford to keep up their business 
with the low income. Because you see what happened is we don't patronize our own business. We go across town before we buy in our community. And I saw that these owners were doing the best they could and they needed help. That's when I created the Bob Malone and I, I, I pushed for that, that surplus to be put on the side for them. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. And now, uh, Mr. Goodson, how do you bring business back to West Anderson? Uh, first, you have to invest in West Anderson. What we have to do is we have to spend money. What we have to do is we have to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, when a company comes to town, they don't ride by an empty lot and say, hey, my lot, you know, my business is a little good there. We have to market ourselves. We have to put a marketing team together. When I rolled to Roanoke, Alabama, and I saw this building, they didn't say hi, I put a funeral home right here. I had a vision. We have to be entrepreneur. We have to invest in entrepreneurship and start from within our community. We have community people. We have specialty people right in our community. If we have, you know, on 15th Street, just to speak of the historic district, we can invest in 15th Street, put historic buildings, put buildings down there, and have what we call pop-up businesses. You know, if you're a shoe tailor, if you're a clothing there, if you're a tailor, go there. Go there for a month. This is part of our urban development plan. Go there for a month. We'll take care of your rent and go to business. Go to work. It's far for big business because that right there would drive jobs anywhere from small to medium to large businesses. You have to prepare that land for them. You have to prepare that area for them. You have to go out to there and you have to bring them here. What I would do is, as a business owner myself, I would go to the table. I would sit at the board meetings with those companies. I would market West Anderson. I would tell them that our land is not polluted anymore. We spend a bunch of money to clean it up and it's time and it's ready for your business to come. Okay. And also within that, I would mandate that you have to put people in our community, in West Anderson, a percentage of your employees need to come from West Anderson. Right Thank, right you. Now. Thank you very much. How will you read this question first? What will you do to get more minority representation among our city leaders, such as police chief, fire chief, judges, and department heads in the city? That is a problem. But our problem in this city, our young people won't volunteer and put an application in for the police or the fire department. We push for that. We have a high school application system that we go and talk to the children that are coming up. We, when we were growing up, we, we enjoyed looking at what to be police officers. We wanted to be firemen. But now, it's such, a, it's such a negative impression. I spent 26 years as a trooper, and I paid my dues by going around to the high school and talking to children, elementary, visiting them. I had a colonel that if you, if he came to your county and the people couldn't tell him that you visit their stores or their schools, you on the carpet in Montgomery that Monday morning. You have to be a part of the community. Now, what we need, and this is what I propose, that we open up the promotion system in our police and fire department. It will be voted on next agenda. You stifle when you kill the top. The young people that are in this department don't have any initiative. Everybody said, well, you're going to kill the promotion. But if you have a young man that's five and six years in the department that took the time to go to school, learn, learn the lessons, learn how to conduct themselves in life. Why shouldn't he have an opportunity to put in an application? He could be police chief also. He could be fire chief also. But absolutely stagnated that you don't have any growth within each department because an uh, African American just don't have a chance to be chief in the city of Anson. He won't be a fire chief. But if we open it up, he have an opportunity to be in on it. He have an opportunity to put applications in. Thank you, Mr. Powerboard. Mr. Goodson, the same question. How do you increase minority representation among the city leadership? Uh, we have to change procedures. Uh, right now we operate with procedure zone um, as far as inside advancement. We have to open it up to allow people to apply from outside. So may the best candidate win. So it's just not a shoe-in position 
from as long as you've been here and you have this position that your captain you go straight to chief because it's a shooting once he retires. Here in Addison, we need the best people for the job. Whether you're a minority, majority, we need the best person for the job. Because when you pick up that phone to call, you want the best, the most responsible, and intelligent person to come out and respond to that call. Okay? Furthermore, what we have to do is we have to educate. We have to put our people in position in order to apply for those positions. Uh, we do have a significant number of minorities who are educated within law enforcement and who do already work into the system. But, as Councilman Powell said, they have no initiative to go further because they see it as a roadblock when it comes to getting any type of upper executive management. What we have to do is we have to get rid of that law and allow the best person for the job to get the job. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Reddick. <clears throat> Same question. How do you improve minority representation among city leadership? We found one thing we do all agree with. We need to open up the procedures. We need to open up the departments. And one thing about the volunteering. You know, we don't have a volunteer fire department here. I served in the military. I'm, I've, I was trained as a firefighter on, on aircraft carriers, one of the hardest areas to do that kind of work in. I have some major training in firefighting techniques. I went to the fire department, I said, I want to volunteer. They said, we don't have a volunteer fire department. You can go volunteer at Oxford or Jacksonville. I don't want to volunteer in Oxford or Jacksonville. I want to volunteer in Anderson, because this is my home. We need to open it up, and we need to educate. We need more educated brothers and sisters out here knowing what's going on and preparing and put in place for those jobs. You know, I had a, I had a friend of mine, he happens to be African American, and he applied for a police department. He put me as a reference. Because, you know, I'm, I'm for seeing more minorities move into these kind of positions. So I'll lead by education and I'll lead by example. I'll, I'll be an open example for people to see how to move into these positions. And I'll help move people into these positions. And I'll be a positive force for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to take some questions from the organizations that arranged our meeting tonight. We'll go to the Get Moving group. And I believe Sam Phillips will have the question. Sam, if you are here, you'll please take the microphone. And uh, Mr. Goodson, this question will begin with you, so you'll be the first one to get to answer it. Education, <coughs> excuse me, we know is an issue. What are you willing to do about other neighboring and municipalities? Can you hear me now? Hold it a little bit closer, please. What are you willing to do about other municipalities and local government? Are you willing to uh, relate and form a relationship with other municipalities? Yes, sir, Mr. Phillips, I am. Yes, sir. I, all, I believe in help your neighbor. All right? If my neighbor is doing something that I don't know, let's sit down and I go back to conversation. Let's sit down and let's talk about what you're doing. Because if your people are benefiting from it, and they're going further than my people are, I want to know what you're doing. Now, I'm not just going to take the whole thing. I'm going to take the foundation of it, and I'm going to do what it takes so I, my people will advance from that. I believe in being the best at whatever we can be in. So as far as cooperating with other municipalities, yes, sir. Put me in office, I will be that person who will sit down first priority to find out what our neighbors are doing so we can do it and do it better. Thank you. All right. Mr. Reddick, coordinating with other communities in our area. <coughs> Absolutely. I want to coordinate. I'm not saying I'm not biased towards Anniston. I do want to see Anniston grow. And typically when a city like Anniston, which is an anchor city, grows, it carries the other surrounding cities with it. As our city grows, other cities are supposed to grow, but we've become stagnant over the years. We've become basically in, in, unusable. We haven't grown as our neighbors have grown. So I, I absolutely want to do that. But I think one key is communication. My ability to communicate and cooperate is going to determine how fast and how well we grow as a city. So you want the best communicator possible to get in there and do that. And, and if we can communicate, if I can communicate to other cities saying, you know what, if our city grows, it's going to help your city because of this and that, then other cities will actually jump on board with us. It's the, the term welcome, what's in it for me? Everybody wants to know that, but I want to know what's in it for me, and I'm going to show you what's in it for you 
by cooperating with me because I think everybody will grow when Aniston takes her rightful place as the center of this county and takes her rightful place as a progressive, productive city. And as we begin to grow, everybody around us will begin to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palmore, how do we cooperate better with our surrounding communities? On a personal basis, I, I get along with all our surrounding communities. I'm on the MPO board. I work with the county, private industry, state. And we get things done. 10th Street, from Quintard all the way to 202, was done because I was on that board and I put forward with that effort to get that done. Wilma, Greenbrier, all that come from MPO project. I believe that you have, if you're going to progress, you have to be a member of something that is effective and can go out and find you other resources. I'm on a lot of boards. I'm on the Ansel DC, Commercial DC, dry <coughs> him. On the Anderson Community Development Council. We, oh, you go on Walnut, we redevelop lot houses to, and they came in, we had operations that had help from Birmingham, other ha habitat. You have to be able to go out and look for cooperation, look for partners. And that's what I've been able to do. You can't, you can't be isolated. And you can't sit around and say, we, why we're not doing it. But you know what? The main thing that we need <coughs> in this city, we need citizen participation. We need citizens that will come out and cooperate. Don't sit back and don't, don't do anything to assist your counsel. Be our crucial and help. When, when we ask for things, you need to be in support of it. But as far as you saying that we, we are not cooperating with other cities, even Oxford, the mayor and the council, I get along very well with them. I often sit down and talk to the mayor. I sit down to other council members because they be a part of the organization that I'm a member of. You have to be able to talk and meet the people. But the first thing you have to do you, you have to be cooperative. Thank you very much, Mr. Palmore. Now, our next question is going to come from Women United, Renita Littles. <laughs> Women Empowered. What did I say? United. 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 United, empowered is a good thing. <laughs> Women Empowered, excuse me, I apologize. What volunteer work and or board appointments have given you the experience to serve our city? What is that experience? Thank you so much for that question, Ms. Lopes. What volunteer work and board appointments? Let's start with board appointments. I was appointed to the uh, Transportation Board. Since my appointment, and I've actually been promoted to chair once I was on that board. Since my appointment, ridership in Aniston is at an all-time high. People have bus stops. I really want to fix up those bus stops and change that glass to something more flexible. But um, we have bus stops for people to ride on and they're comfortable. And I actually want to increase it to every 30 minutes during business hours so people can actually use it for transportation to get to work. So that was a training. And I had to learn a whole lot of stuff once I got on that board. I, I found out there's a lot of intricacies when it comes to approving a budget, approving anything. I served on the um, museum board. Uh, I learned a lot on that board too. I learned about the botanical gardens, what it takes to bring in something like that, and, and the importance of even giving promotions and raises. There's a lot that goes into that. Volunteer work. What have I done in volunteer work? One, this is, I had a hard time getting in and really talking to the students the way I wanted to, so you know what I did? I took a job as a substitute teacher. So when you see these kids walking around here calling me Mr. Reddick, it's because I taught them. And I got, in, I got the opportunity to get in and hear from the kids and see what's really going on in the school so that if I take, when I take this position, I'll be able to, with a clean heart and actually knowing from, you know, in, in, from experience what needs to be done. So I'll be better informed to participate in helping our kids grow. Um, volunteer, 
NAACP. I've had to represent some people who have been mistreated and abused in our city, who have been fired for inappropriate areas. And that has shown me how to get in there and work on the behalf of the people. So I know how to represent, I know how to stand up for what I believe in, and I know how to make the proper decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Mr. Palmore. Now we'd like to for you to tell us about your volunteer activities, your service on boards and agencies uh, that improve the community. Thank you. I have to follow <coughs> them. First, I appoint people to the boards. And I find the best people, best individual that will cooperate with others and work together to make progress. The hospital board, all those boards, I have to appoint people. The, the transit board, also. And the boards I volunteer <coughs> to go on are uh, the MPO, as I said. But I also have the responsibility of making sure that our transportation is adequate. I'm the one, and I you can check, ask for more buses, more bu and larger bus lines, that we can pick up more people. Those bus stops was my idea. We went out to Fort McClellan when it first started, and they got those little abandoned bus stop that the military had and rebuild them and put them out for the community. They are still in existence. We bought new ones to put that we can find any more in Fort McClellan. So those bus stops was my idea and I'll take credit for that. <laughs> now, we want to employ the ridership on that transit through the MPO. That's how we get that done. We increase the, the length of the ride. We do the, the cost. We make sure that the costs are uh, economic for the poor people that have to ride that system. So, as far as the ridership on the MP on the, on the bus, that is as a direct from MPO, and that's where I am giving advice and helping to develop. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. Mr. Goodson, the same question. What have you done in terms of volunteering and uh, serving on councils and boards and agencies? Well, currently I haven't served on any board. I, I currently don't serve on any board. Uh, but as far as volunteer hours, uh, I've spent countless, I started at a grassroots level. You know, I've been in the schools. I uh, spent countless hours within the Anniston City School System. I've been to 10th Street, Cobb, Anniston Middle, and also Anniston High, educating our youth on financial education. That is my profession, so I've been sowing that back into the cities of our youth and our schools. I've taught everything from personal budgeting all the way up to personal financial responsibilities. Um, in results of my volunteership, I've had an increase of students who've come in and opened up what we call junior savings accounts, even if they brought in their first dollar and I also rewarded them and taught them on the initiative of, and the importance of saving. Although on top of that, those students who graduated from Anniston City Schools have also came back in and opened up their first checking account with me to prepare to go to college. So what I've done and what I will continue to do, uh, be it on the board or not on the board, is educate our youth on financial education. It's important to know when they make that dollar, what they need to do with it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Williams from Real Men, I believe you're going to ask the question. No, Reverend, you're going to ask this question too. And uh, the first one to respond will be Mr. Palmore. Yes, my question is, uh, what do we do about the good old boy syndrome? Us boy, no more. How can we get past that and move forward in, in Alabama in the interest of the people in Anderson, Alabama? I want to thank you, Trevor. That is a good question. Something that I've been pondering for all of my days on this council. The good old boy syndrome. That was killing the state. That was killing the nation. And that was killing our city. As I told you about the good old boy syndrome, 
change in the procedure and the promotion in the police and fire. That good old boy system, and you need to look at City Hall and the Park and Recreation. We're increasing now that you look around, you see more of different ethnic groups working in those departments. You come and sit all night, you see more African Americans, more females in those, in those departments. The good old boy system not going to lead as long as the citizen don't fight against it. And we must educate and keep our children educated that when you get on a job, know how to keep that job. Know how to follow directions. And don't get mad when you don't go to work Monday and the man asks you what happened at your customer. <laughs> I learned all this in the military. And the most important lesson I learned was in the jungle of Vietnam. I'm a Vietnam vet. And I sympathize with all these young men that are coming back home and young women are coming back home now. They are at this disadvantage. And it's hard to incorporate back into a society that don't accept you. Now when I came from Vietnam, I did not get to welcome home that anyone else get. That way I go out of my way to welcome these young men and women home. We were baby killers. We were, we were man in the presence. We were dangerous people. But you have to understand, we were sent home straight from the field. I turned my weapon in in Oakland, California, got a state done, and was sent home. Thank you, Mr. Powell Ward. <laughs> Mr. Goodson. No, no, no. I know what the question is, but I want to, I want to ask what the good old boy me. Is it when, like, a friend hires a friend? No. 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 Can I tell me it's fine? Uh, go, go ahead, yes. If you, if you, if you, uh, please give the microphone to the Reverend and he can, and, and very briefly we'll explain this. The good old boy system is not necessarily white or black. It's just people that have been in a position for so long that they connect together with their buddies, but with somebody else or another group or organization try to come in, they don't want them in there because they always, they so tight and they push you aside and move you out the way because they don't want you to be a part of this. They don't want the city to grow without them being the scene of attraction. If you know what I mean. So what, we, what I want to know is what do we do to get these other organizations joined in together with these good old boys that we can come in there and move some of these good old boys aside and put some young people in there, some young organizations, some young citizens in there that we may be able to move forward together. Thank you, man. That says to you that if I don't know what it is, I'll ask you a question. So what do we do about that? I want to tell you. I was a victim of that. 2005 at the University of Alabama, as a freshman, I ran for president of the freshman class. And we had what was called the machine. It was where all of the fraternities got together and they pulled together on which candidate they were going to vote on. Now, we had an open debate such as this right here. And true enough, I must say, I was the best candidate. And they told me I was the best candidate. But it all came down to the people who voted. Yes. And the people got together, the machine got together, and had already decided that they were going to put him in office. Right. And that's the good old boy system. Good now that I know what it is. What do we do about that? It's going to take you. It's going to take the people to not become a victim of the good old boy system. If you know that I'm the best candidate for the job, get behind me and fight for me. All right. Fight with me. Woo. That's how because what we have to know is the good old boy system has been here from the beginning of time and it will be here to come on. But what we can do is we can take advantage of it and we can get behind the people who are the best candidate for the position and we can overcome the good old boy system. All right now. The good old boy club. <laughs> wow. Uh, I remember when I first got back to Anderson. When I was in San Diego, I did a, a, a intern with, with, a, with a convention center, uh, hospitality and tourism. 
And I did some stuff in San Diego as a college student that people had never seen before. So when I got here, I found out about the Spirit of Anderson. And I turned in my resume and I said, I want to work for free. I want to share some of my experience and I want to learn from you. And I, and I gave a resume of all these events that I've done that, that the company that I work for got the business of the year behind my efforts. And when I, and when I sent my resume, and first of all, they didn't respond to me. And, and when I met the lady that was over the organization, you know what she told me? Oh, we're not looking for that kind of stuff right now. So, yeah, that's a good old boy club. And I will educate and I will expose it. And I will go back to the theme of it. Have anybody read The Miseducation of the Negro? Has anybody read the Willie Lynch letter? Has anybody read Black Like Me? We gotta go back and understand why this is there. It's not their fault. It's just something that's been passed down from generation to generation. So we gotta go back and heal this situation. And I'm gonna preach the same message C.T. Vivian preaches. He said, I can't do it as a black man and you can't do it as a white man. We can only do it together. And if we can do that, I did it while I was in the Navy. When I got to my shop, it was a good old boy club. And I got to know them and they got to know me. And that, their whole paradigm changed. And I've done it here in this city. I've gotten to know them. They've gotten to know me. And people are willing to work with me now. They don't tell me I can't help and volunteer anymore. So we have to just go in, educate, and work with these people. And if I love you enough, I... I'll let you know I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And eventually that'll tear down every bit of hurt, pain, and evilness that's inside of you. That's how I want to thank get you, Mr. Boy Club. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Reddick. We appreciate it. That concludes the questions from the organizations. We have a little extra time, so I'm going to go back to some more questions from the audience. And we're going to begin with you, Mr. Goodson, with this next question is again from the audience. What would you do to eliminate crime? Drugs and slacking in the city. And I don't know, that's what I don't know. Maybe you can educate me about that. Slack, slacking, that's my generation. Okay, thank you. Maybe you need to explain that. But I love my friends. I love my friends. The slacking, slacking is a fad. You know, a fad is you do what everybody, so to speak, think is cool. Well, that slacking has become a thing of the past. It's just that our community has fallen behind that fact. <laughs> you know, you go elsewhere, no one is slacking anymore. What we have to do is we have to bring our young men, because that's who slack, our young men up to ball. We have to raise it. And where it starts is it starts right here. It starts right here. Me, with youth leadership, youth example, to show that, hey, it's cool to wear your pants up on your waist. It's cool. What was the other part of your question? Uh, also to eliminate crime and drugs in the city. Crime and drugs. That's everywhere. Anniston is small. Anniston is a community town. You will know someone who lives in West Anniston. They'll know someone who lives in South Anniston. Trust me, I know. I rode my bicycle from McDaniel over to Norwood. If I did anything, my mama knew it before I made it back home. All right. So, we're small. We just have to invest in our police force. We have to invest in our police force, and what we have to do is we have to take strategic data, and we have to put our personnel, our boots on the ground, where it's happening. If it's happening in the project homes, let's have satellite police officers. We're building a new justice center. Let's invest also in satellite police officers. If you know that the crime rate is up in Norwood, and that's where the majority of your killings are coming from, Let's put the police right there in the community. We have to put our police force right there in our community and have more preventative measures as opposed to reactive measures. So that's how we prevent that. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Right. Mr. Red, same question. How do you eliminate crime, drugs, and slacking in the city? Crime, drugs, and slacking. Remember that statistic I talked about earlier? I looked at a JSU study. And according to that study, 31% of our people can't even pay their bills. Seventeen percent of our people ain't, a, ain't don't make enough to be considered broke or poor. We need jobs. Amen. When you take this dope boy who think that dope is the only way he's gonna make some money, and you give him another alternative, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something changed to me when I left Anderson and I joined the military and I saw regular people driving nice cars, living in nice homes, and having nice lives, and they weren't selling drugs. 
I, I'm a product of Aniston. I stuck, I had to change myself. So we need them to be exposed to that. We need the exposure to happen right here. We need to increase our job industry. We need to increase our job dollars. We need. We got 17 of the top 25 companies right here in Aniston, but they're not operating at their full potential. They're operating at half cost and have everything else. We need them to get enough business. I'm gonna promote so that they their businesses can grow. We need them to get enough business to where they're going to have to hire some of these young men and women. And you want to know about slacking? They do, they do it because they're allowed to. When I, was a, when I sub at the school, the first thing kids that they still do, it's, fun, it's the funniest thing in the world. You watch these kids walk around me, they see me coming, they go, they start pulling their pants up. They don't do it around me because I don't allow it to happen. And when our leaders take that leadership role, and when we become the example for these young men, they'll stop doing a lot of these negative things because you know what? Right now, negative feedback is the only feedback they're getting. You know, Martin Luther King said, there comes the point where silence is assistance. Right now, we're not talking to them, we're not growing with them, and we would rather go home and, and get on the couch and watch TV than spend some time investing in a young man, a young woman's life. So it starts with all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. And now, Mr. Palmore, you get the final word of this question. What would you do to eliminate crime, drugs, and slacking in the city? First thing, you have to increase the availability of the police department. You need to be out more patrol, and that's what I talk to the city manager about, that we have more patrols out. Also, I have citizen participation. You turn these drugs in and they don't pacify them. You look the other way and they sell drugs, they only steal it from you. When you have drug problems and infestation in your community, those drug dealers don't care where they get their money from. They'll point a house out to you so they just, they just got a 55 inch TV. I want that TV. I got a pack in for it. Well, you gonna steal that $500 TV and kill him for a 25 pack. And, and, and then you have destroyed a community by destroying the economic value of that house. Now, as far as slacking, I raised a son, I didn't like that so it's up, it's up to the parent. If he's slacking, and you got a belt there, first you use the belt on him, then you can't put it around his loose. <laughs> That's how you were born slacking. Now another thing, people don't realize where slacking came from. Slacking came from prison, where you were born. Yes. So our children should understand that. When they walk down the street looking cool, you are looking stupid. You looking available, and you looking to be victimized. So we have to fight against all of this abnormalities of our community. That means that you parents, the city council can't say that when you don't slack, because first they're going to say you infringe on my rights. And you can't do that. But if you encourage the parents to take charge of their child, and you know, I, I've been pondering this, and it's something I think our court system needs to do. And I know in a lot of other states I, I go to, a lot of cities I go to. If the, if the child is a problem, he go to court, the parents go to court. Thank you, Mr. Palmore. That concludes our time together. I'd like to call on Cynthia Hines from Women Empowered, W.E., and she has some closing remarks. Will you please hand her the microphone? And while she's coming up, I would like to thank all of you for coming, asking some great questions up here, and I want to thank all three organizations for their or for organizing this event. Ms. Hines. Let me clarify my name. It's Cynthia Glover Hines. I too am an Anastonian. The 80 year old Anastonian came back, realized that Aniston can be better. It was good, and it can still be good. So my friend decided that we would come together, a diverse group, we would educate ourselves, 
and advocate for a better city. This is the result. You are the result. We've had three farms. We'll have another one Thursday at First Presbyterian on 10th Street. You are invited. The Mayor's Forum will be next Tuesday. You must come. You must participate. We've had wonderful presentations of our candidates here, but it really depends on you, your vote. You have to decide who is best to lead our city. All of this sitting at home and making excuses is not going to work. I want to thank 17th Street for opening its doors. Uh, all the candidates and the successful